morning. I'm uh, Lieutenant General John Sattler, USMC, retired, uh, 1971 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you this morning to the, uh, to the McCain Conference. This conference is made possible by a generous donation by uh, Ms. Cindy McCain, the spouse of Senator John McCain from the great state of Arizona. Senator McCain is a 1958 graduate of the United States Naval Academy who was shot down in 1967 while flying a combat mission over North Vietnam. Senator McCain spent the next five years of his life in a prisoner of war camp dubbed the Hanoi Hilton. The Stockdale Center's mission is to empower leaders to make courageous and ethical decisions. This conference, the McCain Conference, is one of the center's premier programs to drive that point home. The conference's annual theme coincides with the research done by the Stockdale Center fellows throughout the year and to bring together the best intellects, that would be you, the best intellects in the military and civilian communities to address challenges in military ethics and leadership. The intent is to use the conference to create policy recommendations for senior leaders, develop strategies for effective preparation of present and future leaders to meet these ethical leadership challenges, and to advance the dialogue amongst the thought leaders in the field, which once again is you. We will have two full days of discussions, debate, and presentations on the topic. This year's topic, the ethical dimensions of extraordinary national challenges, a topic that is timely, relevant, and critical to our nation, our armed forces, and those who develop policy and strategy to support our foreign, our forces forward deployed around the world. I hope you enjoy not only the conference, but the great city of Annapolis. Please take the opportunity to get out and see the capital of the state of Maryland. Take also the opportunity to meet new colleagues and to reacquaint yourself with old colleagues. Leave with a fresh perspective on the topic and ideas to implement and discuss in your personal sphere of influence when you return back home. If there's anything at all that we can possibly do to make your stay more pleasurable, please don't hesitate to approach one of the, one of the members of the Stockdale Center, questions, thoughts, ideas, or needs that you may have. All right, so we, we could not be more uniquely <laughs> served by a more uniquely qualified speaker to kick off this conference. We're honored to have the Honorable Michelle Flournoy with us this morning. Ms. Flournoy is currently a senior advisor at the Boston Consultant Group. She serves on the board of directors of both the Center for New American Security and the Atlantic Council. She is also a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She's a member of the Defense Policy Board, a member of the Aspen Strategy Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, and Women in International Security. After the 2008 election, Ms. Flournoy co-led President Obama's transition team at the Department of Defense. She was subsequently nominated and confirmed as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense in the formulation of national security policy, oversight of military plans and operations, and, in national, and represented the Secretary of Defense in National Security County Council meetings. And for those of you who aren't familiar with how the National Security Council functions, there's a policy coordination committee or, uh, that, that, that develops, they make, the, they make the sausage. These are men and women of the about 06 or one star rank or SES equivalents. And then that policy moves forward to what they call the deputies committee. And Ms. Flournoy sat in on the deputies committee which shapes and hones the policy before it goes to the principals. Those are the cabinet members who actually make the decision and the recommendations to the president. I would believe it's probably safe to say, and you can, you can contradict me on this, that you probably, in your three years in that job, that unbelievably important job of developing policy and strategy, probably attended over 1,000 National Security Council meetings on every topic from every country across the globe. So you not only have to be deep, but you have to be extremely wide to be qualified to serve in that unbelievably important position. Ms. Flournoy is a three-time recipient of the Department of Defense 
Medal for Distinguished Public Service. She received that award in 1998, in 2011, and again in 2012. That's quite a span of excellence. She is also a two-time recipient of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Joint Distinguished Civilian Service Award. And again, first time in 2000 and the second time in 2012. A, uh, quite a span of excellence, ma'am. The Honorable Michelle Florno is no stranger to our topic of ethical decisions of extraordinary national significance. Please join me in a warm welcome for an extraordinary woman who has and continues to serve our country in a selfless way, the Honorable Michelle Flournoy. Thank you for that very uh, kind uh, and uh, uh, very warm introduction. Uh, you did unfortunately neglect the most important point in this context, which is I'm also a Navy wife. So, <laughs> um, and and uh, today is actually a, a special day for uh, another reason other than just being here, and that is it is Bring Your Child to Work Day today. So I have a very special special assistant, uh, my daughter Victoria, who's with me here today to kind of get a sense of what what in the world does mom do when she leaves in the morning and, go, and goes to work. So thank you, Victoria, for for being here. Um, but I'm really pleased to have this opportunity um, when I got the call about this conference and I heard not only the topic but who was here um, and the kind of influence that you have over the, develop the professional development of so many officers across our military. I thought this is, this is one I got to say yes to because I think this comes at such a critical time for our, for our nation. We're obviously still in a fiscal crisis. We're also in a crisis of political paralysis. It is a point of uh, a strategic inflection point for the nation as I see it in a time when leadership and particularly, you know, uh, leadership with a moral compass is very, very important for our nation. You know, as we think about the situation we're in, sequestration was the threatened disaster that was never actually supposed to happen. Uh, it was the sword of Damocles that was put into legislation that was supposed to ensure that Democrats and Republicans would come together and come to their senses and actually reach a budget deal. It was a mechanism that was designed to be so draconian and so mindless that it would force the parties to break their political deadlock and return to that tried and true American tradition of pragmatism, uh, pragmatic compromise. The very tradition that has enabled us to uh, uh, govern in a divided democracy for more than 200 years. But here we are. The sword has actually come down on our own heads, and we are no closer to a deal. The very deal that we need to get our economic house in order, to unleash the investment and growth that will drive our economic recovery, and to shore up the foundations of our uh, security, our national security, and our leadership around the world. So in this context of crisis, um, I'd like to, stay, to take a step back with you and think about more strategically about our situation, to consider how we can actually safeguard our defense and our national security in what I think is going to be a prolonged era of budgetary austerity. So I want to start by framing the global security environment as I see it, and then make the case that uh, while it is imperative that we focus on getting our economic house in order, uh, we must also guard against retrenchment. Uh, against pulling back from the world too much, uh, pulling back from our international engagement. Then I want to spend the bulk of my time um, talking about the right ways and the wrong ways to handle the almost inevitable cuts that are coming in defense spending. So let's start with the global security environment. In contrast to past periods when we've experienced drawdowns uh, as wars have come to an end, this time we face not a period of peace, but a period of a very complex and still volatile international security environment. Yes, we're coming out of a decade of war uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan with that 2014 tra transition on the horizon. But we see uh, fundamental shifts in the international system, the rise of new powers like China and India in the Asia Pacific that are uh, changing the dynamics of the region, um, continued threats from Al Qaeda and international terrorist organizations as 
they morph and take new forms, spring up new, uh, new, new af regional affiliates in places like Mali and Yemen. Uh, the danger of uh, Iran's continued pursuit of nuclear weapons, uh, North Korea's provocative behavior, its, its continued uh, growth of its nuclear arsenal, its threats to proliferate that arsenal. Uh, the promise and the uncertainty of the Arab Spring, with the Syrian civil war getting even worse, the uncertain course of the Morsi government in Egypt, and uh, the potential for further instability. We see, when we look to the global commons, the connective tissue of the international economy, if you will, the air, sea, space, cyberspace domains, we see these domains being both increasingly congested and increasingly contested around the world, which will have very important impacts on our national interests and our freedom of action in the future. And the list goes on. I could spend the entire time talking with you about the various challenges that we face. But the bottom line is there is no strategic pause here. There's no danger of peace breaking out around the world um, in the near future. So in this context, I would argue that the, un the United States still has a very unique role to play as a global leader. We remain the indispensable partner in leading alliances, in catalyzing international action to deal with shared problems, uh, and in facing common threats. We cannot and must not retrench. Protecting our well-being, ensuring our interests, um, our prosperity, particularly in an increasingly interde interdependent global economy, requires that we remain engaged abroad. But we have to be smarter and more selective in where and how we engage. Uh, guided by our interests and our values, by a principled pragmatism rather than ideology. Smart and selective engagement will require a more balanced approach both to the use of the instruments of our national power and also to our investment in those instruments. The notion of using the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, development in a more integrated whole of government way is even more important now than ever. We need a more sustainable national security strategy that is grounded in protecting and advancing our interests, our core enduring interests, our prosperity, our security, our way of life. Now is a time to remember that the very foundations of our national power and influence in the world are our economic health uh, and prosperity here at home. Now the U.S. in my reading has a pretty remarkable history of economic vitality and national resilience. We have lived through the worst of times, wars, depressions, recessions, only to rise again from the ashes to emerge once again as the most dynamic, most innovative, and most envied economy of the world. And I have no doubt that we will do so again. So our top priority must be getting our economic house in order. And this is critical to revitalizing our economy, but also to shoring up our standing in the world and to arresting what you increasingly hear, particularly in Asia and the Middle East as you travel abroad, is this very pernicious, but I think erroneous, narrative of US decline. To do this, we've got to find a way to get to a budget deal. Uh, whether it's one big package or a small series of steps uh, that dispels the current uncertainty and unleashes the investment of the private sector and the, the, the certainty that we need, the predictability we need to move forward. Everybody knows what the key elements of this deal are. It's tax reform, it's entitlement reform, it's reining in our deficit spending, reducing our national debt, while still protecting the critical investments that are essential to American competitiveness long term in research and development, in education, in uh, infrastructure, and so forth. But turning to the impact on defense, whatever budget deal ultimately er emerges, we know that defense will be on the table. It has to be. It's 50% of our discretionary spending, 20% of the national budget writ large. It will be in some shape and form a part of the equation. So the real question is, in the, in the context of a very challenging security environment looking forward, um, and given these budget constraints, how do we maintain the best military in the world, 
that is ready and equipped to protect and advance our interests in the future, while still keeping faith with the men and women who serve. The bad news is, historically, we have a terrible record of managing drawdowns. Almost all, historically, have resulted in a hollow force, that is, keeping too much force structure without enough investment in readiness and modernization. There are far more cautionary tales than success stories in our own history. Why? Because the easiest way to reduce DOD spending quickly is to take across the board cuts, hitting force structure and strength, readiness, modernization. We essentially solve budget problems on the back of the force. Instead of doing the harder work of squeezing the money out of inefficient and poorly managed parts of the defense enterprise. We tend to do what's easy rather than what's hard. In past drawdowns, it was also assumed that the U.S. was entering a period of peace. Uh, but as I said, even with the transition in Afghanistan, there's no, uh, no such calm appears on the horizon. Therefore, this time, as we reduce defense spending, it is imperative that we preserve the capabilities, the readiness, the agility of the force to be able to protect our interests in a very challenging and unpredictable future. Uh, I say unpredictable because in addition to being bad at managing drawdowns, we're also terrible at predicting the future. Um, I had the great privilege of working for Secretary uh, Bob Gates, and he was at heart uh, an intelligence analyst throughout his career, and he used to quip you know, who before 2001 would have predicted that we would find ourselves in a 10-year land war in Afghanistan, of all places? We are terrible at predicting how we will uh, use the military of the future. So we re need to retain the ability to respond effectively to a broad range of contingencies and the agility to adjust if and when we get it wrong. This means being very careful to protect mission critical capabilities even as we adjust to a new set of fiscal constraints. Um, making additional deep cuts in force structure, readiness, modernization should be the last resort, not the first course of action. Now I'm not saying that there won't be necessary, that, that, that further adjustments in force structure, readiness, modernization won't be necessary as we shape a 21st century force. But I am saying that we should try to avoid at all costs the past mistakes of hollowing out the force. Which leads to the obvious and hard question. How do you take the cuts? Where do you take reduce spending? Well, as Tom Cruise said and Jerry Maguire, show me the money. And the money in this case is in several key parts of the defense enterprise. Now I'd like tonight, today, to nominate four areas in particular which have experienced unprecedented growth over the last 10 years. And these are areas where I think we could afford to reduce spending without sacrificing our national security or breaking faith with the all-volunteer force. So I'm going to give you my four. And, and all of this has gotten me hate mail. So it's OK. You, some of this you're not going to like. And we can get to that in the Q&A. But first area is overhead and headquarters. Second is how we manage health care. Third is infrastructure, fourth is acquisition. So let's start with overhead and headquarters with a few facts. Now that I'm a Boston consulting group, first you know, rule of a management consultant is start with your fact base. So from 2001 to 2010, the Department uh, of Defense's civilian staff grew from 687,000 to 778,000. That's a 13% increase, and that is not counting an army of civilian contractors that is almost the same size. So that's civil servants and, and, and appointees. In 2011, DOD spent $212 billion on overhead. $212 billion. That is more than the annual GDP of the country of Israel. A couple of observations from my own personal experience as, as undersecretary in policy, I had over a thousand people. Now the interesting thing was when I was in policy as an office director back in the 19s in a DASD, there were only five, six hundred people. Did I think that policy needed to double in size in that period of time? Absolutely not. Did I have the authorities and tools to actually lean out and reshape my workforce? I did not. 
So I had 20% budget vote, you know, cuts to make during my time there. I could cut programs, I could not cut people, even though I knew that I had, uh, I, I could afford to do that. There were far too many management layers, six, seven layers between me and the action officer who wrote the, ex who was the real expert writing the memos for me for those deputies committee meetings. We have too much overhead in the Department of Defense. This is not rocket science. Anybody who's spent any time in the, in the Pentagon knows this. Um, when, you look to, uh, and, and when you look to the private sector, what have Fortune 500 companies been doing in response to the economic downturn? They have been leaning out. They have been using delayering, streamlining, leaning uh, practices to get not only 15 to 20 percent savings by reducing overhead, but also higher performing, more agile organizations. We knew to apply that kind of approach to the Office of the Secretary of Defense the staff, the Joint Staff, the services, the COCOM staffs, the defense agencies, the whole uh, nine yards in headquarters. And I, pr I would venture to say there are billions of dollars in savings there. Now consider health care. Now I recognize that this is a very sensitive issue. Uh, health care benefits for service members, for retirees, for their families are an essential part of the compact, the contract that we make with the men and women who serves and so who serve and, it ha and that, that has to be kept. But my starting premise is that with more aggressive management, we can significantly reduce the costs that DOD pays for health care while maintaining or even improving the quality of care. We are currently on a, an unsustainable trajectory. In 2001, we, the department spent $19 billion on health care. In 2010, it was over $50 billion. In 2015, it's estimated to be over $65 billion. We have gone from 6% of the DOD budget to 10% and growing. The annual growth rate for DOD health care costs is higher than any other part of government or the economy, 10.5% per year. Even the VA is doing better with 9% growth. <laughs> Medicare, 8.5% growth. So the civilian healthcare sector, 6.3% growth. Since 2001, eligibility for TRICARE has uh, exploded. We now have 10 million military members, their families, retirees on TRICARE. And while eligibility has grown substantially, again, in the private sector, you would expect that with that expansion of access, you'd actually bring prices down for the department. No. Uh, prices have gone up, and this is particularly a problem in that when you compare healthcare services utilization between TRICARE and the civilian sector, two and a half times the utilization in TRICARE. In addition, and this is going to offend some of you, so forgive me, 52% of working age retirees have access to uh, healthcare through their private sector employers, but choose to stay on the roles of TRICARE at the cost of billions of dollars to the department which could otherwise be spent on the, for the capabilities we need for the future. And even in the area of pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, with simple changes to the incentive structure, it's estimated that DOD could save a billion dollars of a year simply by incentivizing the use of generics and uh, mail order in the way that's been done in the VA and in the civilian economy. Lastly, our as uh, out-of-pocket expenses for those enrolled in TRICARE really haven't changed since the program's inception in the mid-1990s. So as the costs have skyrocketed, skyrocketed, the government's percentage of the bill has shifted from 73%, which is the original deal, to 88% now. Yet DOD requests for even modest increases in co-pays for services uh, for non-active duty beneficiaries have been repeatedly rejected. Something has to give here. This is unsustainable. The Pentagon needs to be able to manage these costs more aggressively. There are best practices out there that other parts of government and in the civilian healthcare sector that can be used. Um, and Congress needs to provide them with the authorities to do so. Otherwise, this critical benefit for our service members is not sustainable and it's going to undermine investment in the very capabilities we need to accomplish our missions in the future. Uh, third area, excess infrastructure. And this is truly a third rail politically when you go up on Capitol Hill because facilities, bases, depots, these all translate into constituent jobs. <coughs> DOD has not been allowed to uh, 
close any domestic bases that are excess to need or realign its infrastructure significantly since the last base realignment and closure round in 2005. Since then, Congress has prevented DOD from closing facilities that are no longer needed or consolidating infrastructure to better position itself for evolving missions. This inability to streamline, right size our infrastructure hangs like an albatross around the neck of the services and it diverts billions of dollars that could otherwise be plowed into the uh, readiness and modernization. DOD desperately needs another background and we need, all need to be engaging Congress on the strategic trade-offs of not doing one and I'll get to that in a minute. Lastly, we need to fundamentally overhaul and reform how we acquire major systems, acquisition reform. And I want to be the first to applaud some of the efforts that have been made by people like Deputy Secretary Carter in the department with his Better Buying Power Initiative. There has been some progress. However, we still have a requirement system that is fundamentally broken. Uh, we still have timelines that are unresponsive to warfighter need. We still have a lack of agility in the system in terms of being able to adapt to changing threat environments. We have totally perverse incentives for program management managers where the incentive is to spend down your budget before the end of the fiscal year instead of actually do things more efficiently and save money for the taxpayer. Um, we have in inadequately sized and trained cadre of acquisition professionals and completely insufficient dialogue with industry in terms of how do we control cost to taxpayer while also ensuring reasonable return on investment for shareholders. These two things are, do not have to be at odds. It's possible to do both. So again, there's a fundamental opportunity here to reform and to make our approach to modernization much more affordable and responsive in the future. So in sum, my own view is that we need to use the current budget crisis as a burning platform for transformation, to actually think big and seize this as an opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity to change how the department does business. We, uh, in my view, we can't afford to miss it because I, I want to talk a little bit about what happens if we fail? What if we don't gra you know, grab this bull by the horns? The al consider the alternatives. If we cannot reduce the costs of the defense enterprises a as I've described, we will have no choice but to consider some alternative choices, which I think are unpalatable at best, d at worst, dangerous to our national security. We could find ourselves having to reduce our capacity to fight in more than one theater at a time. Being able to field a force that has the size, the capability, the agility to operate and defend our interests in more than one theater of a at a time is essential if you are a global power with global interests. It has been the pillar across administrations for decades of American national strategy. We are going down a road um, in cutting force structure and modernization and readiness that will call that into question if we do not go after costs in these other areas. We could reduce our readiness. We are starting to see that now and our ability to respond to crises in far-flung regions. We know the world doesn't usually give us much warning, right? And so the readiness in being in your force is what you've got when the balloon goes up. Ready, reduce our overseas posture. Bring everybody home. First of all, that's not always cheaper. Secondly, our forces forward are the very ones who do the most to deter aggression, prevent conflict, reassure our allies so they don't have to go seek their own nuclear weapons or do pro provocative things necessarily on their own. We could reduce peacetime engagement with other militaries, sacrifice the very thing we do to help others build their capacity so they can respond and we don't always have to come to the rescue. We could reduce our investment in the future. We could slash and burn R&D. We could decide that we're not going to worry about the critical capabilities we need for the future, dealing with anti-axis area denial threats, improving our ISR, uh, uh, improving our precision strike, uh, harnessing new, new technologies like robotics, unmanned systems, autonomous systems, uh, and so forth. I could go on and I, you, know, you can tell I'm going on a bit of a rant here, but you know, we, e we, we, don't, we really have to, can't get out of this box. Either we 
do the politically difficult things to reduce spending on the enterprise in ways that are smart, or we're going to have to take cuts in capability areas that will be, again, painful if not dangerous to our future. So what does this require? First of all, it requires incredibly strong leadership, vision, tenacity, determination by Secretary Hagel and his team. And I, here I want to applaud the Secretary's NDU speech. I think he laid it, a lot of the right markers down on the table uh, that, that we need to, to look at the defense enterprise to pay part of the bill. We need some very quick but rigorous analysis to actually scope the opportunities and, uh, and, and approaches to getting uh, cost out in some of these areas. We need to have a, a setting clear targets, uh, outcomes, ruthless implementation that manages, uh, holds people accountable for delivering on them. We also need pretty deep and extensive iterative engagement with stakeholders. This is going to be very, this, none of this is easy. I get it that it's hard. But um, I have seen examples that, of stakeholder engagement that do generate buy-in even when it's hard. I'll give you one example. When the Budget Control Act was passed, Congress said, DOD, we know you've already done your QDR, we know you already have your strategy, but now you've got to go find almost $500 billion in the next 10 years. Sorry. Uh, the President, I think, rightly said, that's a very fundamental change in our budget picture. We've got to rethink our strategy. So he brought in all of the service chiefs, the chairman, the COCOMs, multiple, multiple hour sessions at the White House with the President himself, hearing from every voice multiple times, hearing their concerns, hearing their thoughts on what, you know, how we should manage this. And at the end of the day, everybody came out of the room. Not, nobody was satisfied with every, every last you know, um, word in the strategy of the strategic guidance. But everybody felt they'd been heard. Everybody felt they had their ideas on the table. And everybody was willing to sign up and support it as the best possible compromise given the way it, what we'd been given from Congress. So it is possible, and I think it's necessary at this time. We also need to be very creative about the incentives we put in place to try to change some pretty entrenched organized organizational behavior. Here again, um, I've seen this happen in the private sector now with big companies going through fundamental transformation, fundamentally changing how they work, how people behave. It can be, it's very hard, but it can be done. And lastly, Congress. We have to both educate and deeply engage Congress as a full partner in this process. We need to un them to understand the moral imperative of our situation, the risks of failure, and get them to provide some of the additional authorities that the department needs to be able to succeed in this environment. So the stakes are enormous, the risks are huge, but I, so are the opportunities. And I would just leave you with the optimistic thought that I do think that there is opportunity in this moment of crisis and we need to seize it. So let me stop there and open it up for conversation. Thank you. Why don't you tell everybody who your name is and where you're from? You know, it, those are really important points. I do think that the fact that there have been a, a string of very high profile sort of misconduct cases and now growing public awareness of a, a, a problem that I think people inside the military and inside the Pentagon have been aware of, the sexual assault issue. I do agree that it has certainly raised, I've certainly had people ask questions when I go out and speak, approach me, like, what is going on? Do you think that, you know, is there some crisis of ethics in the military, um, you know, et cetera? So I do think there is a, 
uh, bubbling of questioning um, an institution that frankly has been on a pedestal for many years now, particularly since 9-11. Um, people are aware of the incredible service, the incredible sacrifice that's occurred uh, and so forth. But so I do think that it's an important time when for the military to be seen as addressing these issues aggressively and transparently and openly and talking about it as how, how we are addressing these. Um, I think it's also an important time for military leaders, and I, I actually think General Dempsey is doing a great job in this respect, of being seen to be saying, look, we know we need to be part of the solution of this national situation of our economic situation. We're going to do our part, but we're also going to you know, do our jobs of ensuring we do it in a way that protects our national security. And so I think, uh, I think it's a very challenging time for military leadership. Um, but it's a, an important time for them to be, I think, having a more active and open dialogue with the American people where, where they can, where they have those opportunities. Because you're right, there are, there are questions being, there ha are lots of questions that have been raised. Yes. You're going to tell me how hard this is, huh, David? <laughs> So I think the president needs to lay out the vision and the expectation and provide the sort of political top cover uh, and frankly work the Democratic side of the, the Congress um, to support some of these uh, changes. I think it's, this, it's up to the secretary and his team working with the, the chiefs in particular to really translate that into no kidding you know, what do, what, are, what do we think we can do? What are the tar what do I expect to be able to save in different areas? How am I gonna go about that? What authorities do I need to ask Congress for? What's the roadmap to get at your, you know, what's the, the sort of roadmap with a dashboard of metrics and milestones and what's the management process and who am I holding accountable and who's gonna get fired if it doesn't, it doesn't happen? The incentives, all of that needs to be, I think that's the secretary's um, purview. Um, I must say that I think, I think they, there's the beginnings of an articulated vision. Um, I think that you know the departments in the strategic choices and management review. I don't yet see that rigorous plan. Um, my hope is that it will emerge. Um, I don't see it yet. I, one of the challenges is the great uncertainty of the budget levels, whether it's going to be the president's budget or another round of sequestration level cuts. You know, you hear one thing when you're in the administration, you hear another thing when you go up on the hill. And I'm an optimist by nature, but if I had to predict, if I had to put my, you know, my house on the, mar you know, on, the, on the line and bet it, bet something big, I would say this Congress is heading for another round of sequestration level cuts, perhaps with greater flexibility. But the, the big bite that we just experienced is so painful is that well, they're not done yet. There are going to be other bites of that size coming down the road. So um, you're right. It is all about implementations, and I would add um, incentives. Uh, and I'll just make one, tell one story here. When Secretary Gates first started the efficiencies initiative in the Pentagon, sat down with all the service chiefs, told them what he was going to try to get ahead of what, we, what he saw coming, and he asked them for their ideas. And the first meeting where they were supposed to bring back the input, very little got put on the table. He said, well, how about you get to keep half of whatever you find in efficiencies and reinvest it in your priorities? Oh, oh, that's, uh, so next time we met, billions of dollars were suddenly discovered <laughs> in efficiencies because the, we finally got the, got the incentives right. Where you, you win out of this. You get, you get something for finding these efficiencies in some areas. You get to actually keep some of it and reinvent, get more money for the things you care about. 
So we got to think carefully about the how you incentivize people to buy in and play in this process. Yes. So I do think there's a tremendous war weariness both on the part of the American people and in terms of an administration that really does understand the number one job is, and, and a Congress that understands the number one job is getting the economic house in order, um, and is loath to be drawn into major new military, particularly boots on the ground kind of commitments. Um, you know, my own sense is that the world doesn't always cooperate. <laughs> And we will be presented with use of force decisions, uh, all kinds of contingencies, you know, in the years ahead. My biggest worry right now is that in our haste to be done with Afghanistan and to move on and refocus elsewhere, we will not actually pause to, to learn. What are we supposed to learn from the last decade in terms of the how we went to war, how we define the objectives, how we define the, uh, the, the operational concept, um, how we did on the ground. I mean, it's one thing to say we're not going to do that, you know, two large simultaneous land wars at this, you know. We're not unlikely to do that anytime soon. I get it. But we certainly should uh, undertake a serious discussion of what we should take away from the experience of the last 13 years before we just put it in a box and put it on the shelf and pretend we're never going to do it again. Um, one of the things I'm trying to encourage my old think tank, CNAS, um, to do is to really provide some leadership in some of that lessons learned uh, work, both, again, strategically and, and also understanding from a purely military operational perspective what are some of the things we should learn. But I think going forward, um, we're going to have continued challenge and instability throughout the in, uh, Middle East. There are going to be things that do touch on our vital interests, and we're going to have real choices to make about how to respond to those. Um, I also think that longer term, the fundamental changes that are happening in Asia Pacific will touch our vital interests, and we will have very important stake in trying to maintain stability, protect our own economic interests, our out the you know our allies' well-being, uh, uh, to help defend our allies, and so forth. So, again, um, lots of challenges going forward. My worry is that the war weariness will translate into we just don't want to be involved. And we do that, we've, no, we've seen that movie before as a nation. When we do that, it is at our peril. We we, it is never, never comes out well for us, right? Yes, sir. Well, I, I agree with you that um, if we're really going to do this right, we start with a very fundamental reform of the FAR and ITAR and you know the, the whole regulatory structure. Um, 
I think that should be on the agenda. I don't. I wouldn't hold. I wouldn't hold your breath waiting to start with that. So at you know, in while you're waiting for that to happen, I think there are other things that that can be done in in and starting with something we can control, which is how we define and manage requirements. You know, one of the things that historically, it used to be that you'd start an acquisition program, and within, after a couple of years and a few units being, of the, you know, the, the units of the whatever platform was being fielded, you get on this nice economies of scale curve. And the cost, the unit, per unit cost would go down and down and down. That's because we had the discipline to actually stick with the requirements as opposed to let's change them about a hundred times over the lifetime of the program and keep re having to re-engineer, re you know, add cost, add cost, add cost, and wonder why did we never get any economies at scale? I mean, I mean, I would seriously, th I think there needs to be much more um, business education in the acquisition community, much more and deeper dialogue with industry about how this actually works. I mean, when you sit down with industry, there are ways to actually bring cost to the government down and ensure they still have return on investment they need for Wall Street, right? These are all publicly traded companies. There are really dumb ways to bring it down and there are really smart ways to bring it down. And based on the track record of how governments try to do things, it's not clear that the people setting that policy actually understand how these businesses work and what they need to be successful. So there are some win-win opportunities here but we're not always finding them. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, we've got to take a systemic look at the incentive structure for program managers. You know, yeah, right now, the worst thing you can do as a program manager is not just spend every last cent you have, even if you don't feel you need to, to get the capabilities, you know, get to the capability models that you're supposed to hit. Because next year, if you don't do that, you'll get much less money for the program, and that looks like you're, it's a loss. And you're not going to get promoted if you do that. I mean, that's perverse. That is not the way this should be running. People should be rewarded for getting the capabilities that we need and doing it more cost effectively. So, I, I mean, there's a whole, there's a very, it's not rocket science, but it needs to be fairly systemic in how you, how you approach this. I'm going to come back to you, Dave. Yes. Sure, Mr. Kirk. First of all, to the active Guard Reserve mix, as you're trying to maintain capacity, you can really talk about during the period of physical austerity. We've seen over the last 10 years a couple of things have changed. One is our, our reserve and guard forces, as well as, of course, back in the Air Force and the Army, are really now a rotational force, whereas historically they had no reserve force. So they're now, they've, they've shown a then second of all, of course, at, within the last year, we've now elevated the head of the National Guard to a four-star equivalent. So he or she is now a true stakeholder and equivalent of all those service chiefs. So as you look out there in the future, trying to preserve that capability for past while <coughs> realizing budget for them. Any thoughts on how we balance out that active guard reserve component? Yes. It's a great question because I think the the highly uh, operational uh, reserve model that we've migrated to was very much driven by the rotation and off tempo of t this very unusual situation of two large simultaneous land wars. You needed them as part of the rotation base even as you grew the active duty. You needed that extra support from the reserves to be able to sustain these two efforts simultaneously. I think now it's a good time to step back and have ask some more fundamental questions. Of what do we want the roles of the Guard and Reserve to be going forward? Um, to ask, do you want uh, more of a mixed model where there, there are parts of particularly combat service, combat service support type of capabilities that need to be fairly ready and you know, able to be more on more of an operational reserve footing. But there are other parts of the reserve that are really your ultimate strategic hedge, that are for a very unlikely, you know, catastrophic threat to the nation kind of scenarios. Um, but you still want that hedge. Um, I think so. I think there's rule. There's room for a very fundamental discussion about roles and missions, about design and operational concept. And now I'm going to get hate mail again. Um, infrastructure and 
resources. Um, because of the politics um, of you know the, the National Guard in particular, very, very powerful politically throughout you know the, the country for understandable reasons, certainly on the Hill. As we have done backgrounds, as we have besides <coughs> our infrastructure in the past, they have been relatively or disproportionately protected um, as the act of duty has been kind of reshaped. That was fine, I mean, it wasn't fine, but it was, you know, we could live with that and make other trades work around that at a time of budgetary relative, relative uh, um, you know, wealth and flexibility. That is no longer pop, no, oh, you, we just, we cannot afford that going forward. Um, and so again, this has, we have to engender some very tough conversations with all the stakeholders involved to try to right size um, uh, the garden and garden reserve infrastructure going forward, just as we're right sizing the rest of DoD. Yes. John, John Newell, I'm class of '62 from the Naval Academy. Thanks again for coming. Uh, in the area of sort of catching someone doing something right, I'd just like to footnote a uh, an issue that could be useful also in this day seminar to discuss further in terms of implementation. And uh, General Whistler, the Assistant Commandant for Resources, is going to speak tomorrow. And one of the areas that uh, the department has been lagging far behind uh, the rest of the government and the private sector has been in the execution and implementation of the gap account. It's, it's sort of a minor, maybe way down in the weeds to a lot of people, but it's also fundamental to the concept of developed way back in the 50s, which is planning, programming, budgeting, execution. And in 1990, the, the Congress passed the rule law that, that we'd have gap accounting for all uh, department levels, uh, chemical departments, and it spread from there. Defense was the laggard for, for understandable reasons. It's one of the biggest outfits in the world. Um, until the Marine Corps took up the cudgel to, to make it happen, at some risk, I know, yeah. um, and the interesting issue associated with that is how Congress was a bit of a fly in the ointment there. On the, the, on the budget side, they wanted to cut the cost of audit because it was ten million dollars a year, and they weren't seeing satisfactory results right away. And the, and the uh, implementation side of Congress, the uh, budget non-budget, but the uh, budget uh, government operations side was from where the, the uh, legislation came. And until they went back up to fight it and say, no, we, we really want to be audited, can you believe that? And we demonstrated that there's some efficiency, a return on investment, and, we got, and that was documented by General Whistler and his team, um, that con Congress was its own worst enemy. It was, you know, being sort of practice it's a very interesting, um, I think, case study that uh, we can ask some questions to General Whistler about in his support as people, his civilian team who is working on that. Um, I don't really have any other comments on that. This is kind of a. I, no, it's I'm actually, sure it's, it's, listened, it sounds you. like a very technical, um, in the weeds kind of thing. But the, you know, think about it. I mean, the idea that the largest single agency. In, in terms of spending of taxpayer dollars, cannot pass an audit. I mean, that's not acceptable, right? <laughs> I mean, as a taxpayer, that's not acceptable. And not only that, but you know, one of the challenges is the department does not produce decision quality budget data, cost data, like not not sort of estimates budget, yeah, we got that. But what did we actually spend? If the secretary says, what did we actually spend, and did we spend <coughs> according to plan, did we go under, did we go over? I mean, trying to get that kind of data to support fundamental decisions about where to protect an investment, where to adjust, where to accept and manage a degree of risk. If you don't have that kind of data, it's hard, you're making decisions based on kind of, you know, throwing something against the wall and, and you know, 
hoping that the estimate is right. So this is, it, it sounds technical and in the weeds, but this is very fundamental in terms of giving decision makers the quality of data they need to have confidence that they're making the right calls and judgments. Yes, Mark. Thank you again for coming. Uh, Captain Mark Agrod here at the Naval Academy. Uh, in addition to many years in the fleet and in Afghanistan, I'm a historian of technology. And I wonder if you have such a unique perspective, all the years you've worked with Ben and being head of policy and looking at the globe, that I sometimes wonder if we focus on, you know, American declinism, which is a, a topic here, and in fact we're missing the fact that something systemically is happening across the globe. When you think about recently, Japan is about to inflate like it has never done before. Europe is in chaos with their economic system. We have these new forms of power, cyber power. Uh, just recently picked up this book by you know, Eric Schmidt, you know, the digital age, and, and all this stuff is going to change. And everything we see here is going to begin to change. Do you have any thoughts on, on probably one of your introductory comments that it's not going to get more peaceful, it's going to get worse uh, from the perspective you've had on looking at the whole globe and what's going on here? Maybe give a little more fidelity of how much worse or how much disruption uh, is in the back of your mind and think about what's coming. Or maybe not. Maybe it's going to stabilize. I don't know. You know, I, I think you know. I think it's going to be. I, I, I am. I am an optimist by nature, and um, I don't want to completely depress my daughter. So I'm, I'm not going to say that the world's going to go to hell, and by the time she's an adult, forget it. You know. Um, but uh, I think it, it, you use the term disruption. I think we are in a period of fundamentally dis, uh, fundamental discontinuity, um, and it's going to be with us for quite, like at least this generation, if not more. And I don't think we'll know exactly where we're gonna end up. But what I do know is that the, the, the our, our models for um, making decisions, for understanding what's going on and being responsive to the, in the right kind of timelines, it are inadequate. I mean, I watched it in that, you know, windowless situation where the, the general mentioned, <laughs> you spend hours and hours and hours in. The, 24-7 news cycle, the availability of the internet, the, the, um, the compre extreme compression of decision-making windows when you have you know, all near total, you know, a huge amount of access to information and uh, globally, uh, ac you know, across just unbelievable things that were barriers that were kind of defined you know, how we operated as a society in the past. Now, the good news is the younger generations know this, they operate, they live in this world, they're very comfortable with it. They come into the Defense Department and cannot believe the slowness of our processes and how we, and we, how we do business. Um, so, you know, talk about needing more responsive acquisition system. When you're talking about IT, where the generational cycle of improvements is what, under 18 months? I mean, you know, you can't take 10 years to field a new IT system. I mean, it's gonna be out of date before you even test it. So um, I, do, I think we're into a period of you know, profound discontinuity. I think whether it turns out to be better or worse depends on how we play our cards. A lot of my problems with the intelligence estimates you see with the NICS global this or that report is that they don't treat the United States as a core variable. What we do as the leading power in the world matters to how the world, how things come out. I'm not saying we control it. I'm not saying we can write the history with our own pen. I am saying that we have, have profound influence. The nature of the influence and leverage is changing, but what we do matters. So I think we can have better or worse outcomes depending on how we play the cards with I agree strongly with everything you said so far. And uh, when I was on the French business board for eight years, and I was told of general for 10 years, one of the things that we recommended at GAO was to recognize the reality of the facts. You're talking about major transformational change. From one of the largest entities on the face of the world. Uh, that is more than a full-time job that has to be dealt with at the right level. And we recommended that there be a level two position 
Deputy Secretary of Defense for management that would be responsible for pulling together the plan, executing the plan, the professional qualifications, term appointment, performance contracts, and unfortunately, the, the, the Congress passed a watered-down version. Yeah. And I told them on the front end, it wasn't going to work. And so I think one of the things that needs to be thought of is do we need to come back to it? Uh, and do we need to create mechanisms that will force Congress to make tough choices. <coughs> and in that regard, I'll be talking in my remarks about something called the Government Transformation Initiative Coalition that would do just that. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of things you're talking about, Congress is part of the problem. Right, right. And they need to be part of the solution. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry I'm not gonna be able to hear your talk, but I, 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 I actually agree, we, I, I do think we need to revisit that position. It is more than a full-time job it will take someone with a different kind of qualification than is typically the case for a lot of the political appointees. Um, and it's frankly, that it's also gonna require both you know, tremendous, you know, bringing some of the best talent that you have available internally along with some <coughs> external help to figure out how to get this done. Um, the, uh, uh, in terms of the Congress, I agree, this is really part of probably the toughest nut to crack. Um, I've thought, you know, although people have had mixed experience with BRAC, um, because, I, partly because it, the last round didn't save as much money as predicted, because if you actually look at the details of the last round, it was more realignment than closure, in that we spent a lot of money doing that realignment. So, But the mechanism of, you know, you have an, an expert group puts together a slate of changes that need to be made, and then Congress hits an up or down vote, no amendments. I wonder if a mechanism like that for a broader set of reform initiatives that said, you know, if you've given us this budget, you know, tar constraint as Congress, we are going to meet, you know, X amount of that constraint with a whole series, a package of reform measures and we're going to have, a, you know, the best and brightest work on this from inside, from outside, bipartisan. We're going to come up with this, but then when you you consider it, you don't get to mess with it. You get an up or down vote. <coughs> it's going to be shared pain, but it's going to get us to where we need to go. I think there's something to that mechanism that we should explore using on beyond just the base realignment enclosure. Okay. Now we have time for one more. Okay. Maybe had up four or five times here. <laughs> so all stand, please sit down. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for talk. I'm Roger Herbert. I'm a retired Naval officer turned uh, geriatric PhD student at UVA. Um, so, so humanitarian crises happen. Uh, they can be costly. Uh, they can be risky. They don't always fit into our conventional understanding of what the national interest uh, is. And sometimes really, it's only the United States that can respond effectively to some of these. Uh, do you expect that the new budget environment is going to somehow affect the cut line on what the U.S. will or will not commit to? How much suffering will it part of? How, 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 for instance, has budget discussions entered into dialogue on Syria, uh, for example, in response to those you know, humanitarian issues? Yeah, you know, um, it's a good question. Um, I, but from my own experience in these discussions and how they play out, I would be surprised. Um, you know, when you look at the example of Libya, where we didn't have vital national interests involved, but what the, what, what the president seized on was, you know, if I have the power to actually stop the massacre, prevent the massacre of 35,000 civilians by their own government. Do I, do I do that or do I stop? Now, we can't be everywhere intervening anywhere. But what was available to us in Libya is we had Arab League and NATO allies who did think their vital interests were involved and did want to actually lead the operation. What they needed from the U.S was the leadership to set the conditions, provide an enabling backbone of ISR, refueling, command and control, and they would do, you know, they would do the persistent 
flying and strike missions and so forth uh, and so on. Now that was pejoratively characterized as you know, leadership from behind. I actually think it was leadership that was trying to match our limited interests with the values of, try, of the humanitarian value um, and trying to enable others who felt more, even more strongly affected by the situation to be able to fully participate and even lead as NATO. So, you know, going forward, I think the truth is, you know, when I talked about selective engagement, it is, it's primarily interest, but it is also values. We, our pragmatism as a country has always been a principled one. And there are times when the humanitarian situation is a president, president, Republican, Democrat, I mean, this, this goes across politics. They're gonna feel compelled to respond. And in most, in the cases I'm aware of, and I've witnessed, um, the budget stuff doesn't tend to come into it. That's some, you know, it's something you deal with afterward of, you know, how are we gonna make your O&M funds hold after the fact. But, you know, again, I, so I would be surprised if that calculus changed fundamentally, but I think on Syria what you're seeing is something different, which is um, the, uh, a concern about being drawn into an, an, a, a, you know, a land conflict um, in the heart of the Middle East, in the middle, middle of the Civil War. Now, we could have an argue, you know, a discussion, uh, but we're running out of time, so I'm gonna be saved by the bell, about whether the U.S. can and should be doing more, and I actually believe we can and should be doing more short of putting boots on the ground, but, um, but that's for another time. Thank you very much. You know, and our, uh, our topic, ethical dimensions of, uh, of uh, national crises, basically, uh, I think we've laid the framework, the framework to get great discussion during the break and continue along. But in your opening comments, you mentioned the moral compass. So the Stockdale Center uh, does have a, a moral compass, which can sit on, not, you don't need it, but everybody who comes in your office, point to it and remind them that ethical decisions are tough. It means doing the right thing when, uh, when it, that you're going to receive criticism from, from peers, possibly seniors and subordinates. So I think you've laid it out to us. We need those top ethical decisions on behalf of the center. Thank you very much, and please, another round of applause. For thank you, Mr. Thank you very much.